I have a law background, so I've been doing intellectual property research, weirdly, since that has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with what I'm about to talk about. Uh, but I've gotten really interested in, as you mentioned, the legal and ethical issues around robotic technology. Uh, and the reason is, well, I, I guess the real reason is that I love robots, but the other reason is that I've been working at the Media Lab at MIT, and so I've been in close proximity to roboticists, and we've kind of discovered that there are actually a lot of issues at the intersection of social sciences and robotics that really deserve to be discussed, and there aren't enough people discussing them right now. And one reason for that is that in academia, the structures that we operate in make it really hard to do like true interdisciplinary work. And But I, I really want us to start bridging that gap um, in this context. And one of the reasons I think that's so important right now is that um, robotic technology has really moved fairly recently from being kind of in the background and largely present in manufacturing contexts to all these new areas like the military and transportation and healthcare and children's toys and our households. And where's the clicker? <laughs> Where? Ah, thank you. Okay. Um, so all of these new areas that um, inherently raise these ethical issues with or without robots and when we're introducing this new technology it, it seems worth thinking about the impact and also maybe reconsidering some of the policies that we currently have in place because technology develops pretty quickly or at least more quickly than law develops and sometimes more quickly than even society can keep up with it. So I think it's really important to start talking about this stuff now and there are a few people um, thinking about these things and so I just want to give you a brief overview of some of the issues and concerns that people have right now. So robot ethics concerns fit into three broad categories. The first is safety. So how do you assign responsibility when something goes wrong? And the interesting thing about applying our current legal system to robotics is that we have, on the one hand, kind of product liability rules that assign responsibility when your toaster causes some physical damage. And then on the other side we have like software which is kind of more governed by contract law in terms of service and oops we lost some of your data but the worst that can happen is that we lose some of your data. Um, and so really when you have a robot that marries hardware and software you know, it's not clear should the manufacturer of the platform be held liable, should one of the people who uh, you know, develop this code, be held liable, because you have software that can cause physical damage. And what if it's open source software? And what if it's software that has like emergent learning behavior and is, is kind of autonomous in that way and kind of unpredictable? So uh, we really need to think about where to assign responsibility so that we're minimizing harm but also not discouraging the use of open platforms. Um, and then Ethics can come into this as well. So, for instance, if you have autonomous vehicles, autonomous aerial robots that need to interact with their surroundings, they're going to be making what some people view as inherently ethical decisions. So, like, an extreme example would be the self-driving car needs to decide whether to run into a baby carriage and kill the baby or swerve and run into a pole and possibly kill the driver. And so who's making that decision? Is it the driver? Is it the programmer? Is it a board at Google? We really need to start thinking about these things. The second category is privacy. Privacy is a big issue in general, but um, robotic technology does introduce new ways of collecting data, data retention. And interestingly to me, people seem to have a more visceral reaction to certain types of data collection. So if their email is being monitored, it's like, okay, oh well, but if they see this like flying robot that might be filming them, they freak out and want a hunting license to shoot the thing down. So and like that does raise interesting design questions and, and uh, you know, depending on whether you want people to really care about privacy or not. 
then the third category is the one that I'm most interested in, and that's the social issues around elderly care and child care and sexual behavior and those types of things. And so I want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, there's one aspect of this that fascinates me in particular that we've heard a little bit about today, and that's our tendency to project lifelike qualities onto robotic objects. So as Cynthia mentioned in her talk this morning, you know, we're, we, we're, having, we're seeing an increase of these robots that are specifically designed to engage us on a social level. And what we're seeing is that people really project onto these robots. They'll ascribe states of mind and intent and emotions to them. And psychologists, so for example, uh, Sherry Turkle here at MIT has shown that people will develop emotional attachments to these objects, and sometimes these attachments are really strong. And now you can say, well, so what? People have developed attachments to objects forever. They've fallen in love with their cars, their smartphones, their stuffed animals. People will become attached to virtual objects, like the companion cube in the game Portal, where after playing with this thing for the whole game, the player is required to incinerate it, and often people will sacrifice themselves and lose the game instead of you know, hurting their cube. So people fall in love with things, it's true. We have some reason to believe that this is significantly stronger for social robots. Um, and so uh, we, we think that this could be due to the interplay of three factors. The first is physicality, because we are very physical creatures. We seem to be hardwired to respond to something in our physical space in a way that's different to something on a screen. Um, and the second is perceived autonomous motion or behavior. So if you just take the Roomba vacuum cleaner, for instance, it's very simple. It's not designed to be your friend. It just cleans your floor following the, sim following the simple algorithm, and people just because it's like moving around on its own will name it and they'll feel bad for it when it gets stuck under the couch. So that's, that's a simple example. More extreme example is military robots where we've known anecdotally for a long time, but now there's been some, some research on it by Julie Carpenter and others showing that soldiers working with these robots and military teams will really bond with them, they'll name them, they'll give them medals of honor when they get like broken, they'll insist on getting the same one back, and if it can't be repaired, they'll have a funeral. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy. And, and the craziest thing to me is that like these robots aren't even designed to elicit this type of emotional response, right? And so that brings us to the third factor, which is when you have social robots that are specifically designed to target this emotional response, you know, that makes the the uh, emotional attachment effect potentially stronger. So this is a pleo dinosaur. It's really cute. It responds to touch. If you hold it up by the tail, it'll like pretend to be upset. And so about a year ago with my friend Hannes Gossel, we did a workshop where we gave groups of people a pleo. We had five pleos and had them name them and play with them, interact with them. And then at the end, we asked them to torture and kill them. And it, it turned out to be really dramatic. We, we had been expecting, you know, all the pleos to be destroyed, but we ended up having to play mind games with them because they wouldn't even strike the things. And then we had to be like, oh, we're going to destroy all of the pleos unless you take this hatchet to one of them. And finally they did, and there was a moment of silence. It was, it was really dramatic. Um, but what we came away with feeling um, is that people respond to the social cues from these lifelike machines, even if they're fully aware that it's a robot and they know that it's not real. So why is this important? You know, why are we talking about this? Well, some of the people who have researched this emotional attachment effect, this projection effect, are claiming that this is a bad thing and it needs to be prevented. And they have, I mean, they have some arguments that are more or less convincing to me, some more, some less. One argument is, well, if people are treating things like they're alive, but they're not alive, that breeds a society that doesn't distinguish between real and fake, and we lose the value of authenticity. 
I'm trying not to sound too sarcastic, because <laughs> honestly, that's like not number one on my list of concerns. Uh, first of all, I, I'm not sure why it's a concern at all, but then also like it could go the other direction, right? Like in Blade Runner, where people value the real animals even though they're indistinguishable from the fake ones. Um, and then another argument is, well, it's really um, kind of seductive and easy and awesome to have like these relationships and these interactions with robots and it's much easier than our interactions with humans because humans are complicated and difficult and so it's going to put a toll on our interpersonal communication and relationships and so I also don't know how I feel about this argument because it seems to be the argument that people make every time a new technology is developed it's going to destroy our humanity um, but there is a context where I think it's worth thinking about, and that is when we're using social robots to replace human interaction and human care in, for instance, elderly care or child care or educational situations, um, and not using them to supplement people or to give uh, people something where they didn't have anything before, I think it's worth thinking about you know, what aspects get lost if we're replacing human contact. So there's that. And then the argument that I think is most interesting that I don't hear a lot of people talking about is the danger of having these emotional attachments to robotic objects manipulated. And so what I mean by that is like if you've seen the Spike Jones movie Her, and if you, you haven't seen it, uh, I don't think it's a spoiler to say it's about a dude who falls in love with an operating system. And <laughs> So, I mean, the movie itself is more about love and relationships and less about the technology. Uh, but if it were about the technology, one thing that I would be interested in that the movie doesn't look at is, you know, what is this company that is selling this operating system? What interest does this company have? Like, what if they issue a software upgrade that costs $10,000 and people pay for it? Is that exploitation? Like, where, where does that cross the line? And more insidiously, um, using the example of some of the robots that Cynthia presented this morning, so say you have the robot that teaches your child vocabulary. What if that vocabulary you know, also has the words Happy Meal or Coca-Cola in it? Like, is that okay? Is it not okay? Or if you take the, the weight loss coach robot um, and your mom has this weight loss coach robot and part of the thing that it does is like have conversations with her. And it like stores these conversations in the cloud so they can have better conversations and remember stuff. And she's telling it all these things about her health, maybe about her kids. And all this is going into a database and she's not really aware of that. She's just like talking to it. Is that okay? And under what circumstances can the government access that information? So there are some questions there that I think are worth discussing. But I do not think that that means that these emotional attachments are inherently a bad thing or that we should discourage them. Um, first of all, I'm not sure how you're going to prevent this from happening. People obviously love to anthropomorphize robotic objects. Also, like, what are you going to do? Appeal to all of the universities and all the companies and the toy companies to stop developing technology that's engaging and attractive? Like, I don't think that's really realistic. <laughs> um, and But more importantly, we're already seeing so many great uses of this technology. So Cynthia mentioned this morning um, a lot of the stuff that they're working on. We're seeing great uses in health and education, and this is just this is still a, a very a very primitive stage. So the possibilities are endless, and I don't ra really want to give that up. But like I said, there are issues. Um, one of the things that that I haven't mentioned that um, I've been researching specifically is the question of whether, you know, if we end up kind of embracing this, <laughs> viewing, viewing social robots as like a, giving them a kind of a special status, perceiving them as like these special objects, do we at some point maybe even need to start treating them like objects with a special status? And what I mean by that is if you think about the workshop that I did, um, if it, is so you know, traumatizing and distressing to people to abuse things that respond in a lifelike way, you know, should we be doing it? And 
if we're doing it, what does that mean? Does that mean that we're turning off a part of our empathy that effectively translates to, you know, other types of behavior? Do, could we even become desensitized to violent behavior against other things? And so if you look, I mean, increasingly small children and elderly people can't really tell the difference between lifelike and alive things. And even for us who are adults, it's so muddled in our subconscious that there is a question of whether this behavior could translate. Um, and we've seen this. So for instance, in the United States, if you have a um, animal abuse case in a household, it'll automatically trigger a child abuse investigation in certain states because we know that this behavior translates. And there's also, you know, urban legends about SS soldiers having been given a puppy to raise and having to kill it as part of their training. And whether that's true or not, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's a true story, but you can see why people would tell these stories. Um, there is some concern there. And so what I've been doing is I've been designing some experiments around this because I think it's worth looking at. Um, so some experiments around anthropomorphism, violent behavior, some stuff around uh, the social interactions around this stuff that has partly come out of conversations with people who are here, like Brad Knox, he's right up there. Um, and then something I'm also really interested in is the difference between something that's virtual on a screen and something that's in our physical space in this context. Because if it turns out that there's a difference, um, that could take the whole violence in video games debate to an entirely new level. So that's what I'm working on. Um, and I'll just end by saying I really wish that more people were working on these issues, not just my stuff specifically, but all of the stuff that I talked about. Um, there's a terrifying lack of expertise in these areas, and we really need roboticists and social scientists and policy people to be talking to each other. So please, you know, if you're interested in any of this, contact us. And um, especially contact me if you have a lot of money or robots that you want to give me <laughs> <laughs> so that I can emotionally traumatize people in controlled experiments and have them smash them. Thank you.